Hello and welcome to a special video edition of the Human Echoes podcast. I'm Albert Bird. This is Tony Southcott. Yeah, right. <laughs> this is my wife, Ashley. Uh, Tony lives in a different state, so he couldn't be here. He also doesn't have boobs. So, benefits galore. Um, we're here to talk to you today a little bit about the Spellman Files specifically the last word which is the most recent and kind of the last one in the series sort of uh that's a little bit of a spoiler speaking of we're gonna be doing some spoilers in this um so if you are not familiar for the whole series by the way we're gonna talk about all the books leading up to this one so if you haven't read the spellmans i recommend them uh i they i feel like they've dropped off a little bit in the last couple books but they're still a lot of fun uh, so if you don't want to have it spoiled go ahead and check them out I, I give you my recommendation for that what do you say absolutely absolutely it's one of those book series that even as a, a busy mom you can read through the book in oh four or five days just you know an hour here or there so it's definitely worth checking out yeah I introduced these to you um, when was it? I had the first one before we got married, right? I had the it was the the Spellman Files was the first one. I picked it up at the remainder bin uh, at Books a Million or Barnes and Noble or something, and I was like, "This looks interesting." In fact, I have the book here. All the people looking through the little newspaper, the little eyeballs, eyeballs are very important on the cover of the Spellman Files. And we even gave a copy of it in paperback form to my sister as a Christmas gift, or while she was in the hospital. Yeah. And she couldn't put it down so and that was being on you know drugs and medications from having surgery we've given them away i've loaned it out to people so definitely we can recommend the series uh as a whole we're going to talk kind of specifically about the last word which is this one here the little again the eyeballs i'm making the point about the eyeballs because i'm kind of ticked off because the fifth book in the series didn't have eyeballs on the cover remember that the trail of the spellmans we do not have that. We have all the other books. One, two, three, four, five. All have eyeballs on the covers. Trail of the Spellmans did not have eyeballs. Yes, it does. No, it doesn't. It has footprints. Oh. It has footprints towards an open door and the... the mm, tick me off. No eyeballs. I'll put a picture in the, in the video. We rented it from the... Rented it. We got it from the library. And read that one. We wanted to read it, but I just, I was so upset. They need to release a hardback cover with eyeballs, whoever publishes this. Well, are you considering <sighs> these little marks on the fifth book eyeballs? Yeah, yeah, because they're like, they're faces in the little negative space of, see, there's the nose, and then the other nose, and the eyebrows. See? I do see that now, but I've never paid that much attention to it. I just thought it was Yeah, weird. there's there's even a face down here looking up into the crotch. <laughs> kind of weird. Um... <laughs> Only you would point that out. I'm just saying. I mean, there's other faces that are sniffing the armpits, so whoever's up there at the top, they've really got, you know, they're just like sniffing right into the ears. That's okay. Uh, um, but yeah, I'm glad to see the return of the eyeballs on the cover art. It has nothing to do with the story. but So we've been reading these together for however long, since we got married, because I showed her this, the first one. Um, she really liked Spellman Files, so we've been picking them up as they come out and reading them. Uh, I'll read one, she'll read it, or vice versa, and uh, talking about it as we go. I'll be like, oh, did you get to this part? Did you get to this part? Uh, and so that's sort of been our modus operandi, and this is, I guess we could say it's the last one? Sort of? They kind of left it, in, like... I don't think they want to kill the Golden Goose. I feel like they want to leave room for more stuff to happen. But if they do come out with another book, it's going to be from another character's perspective, so it's not going to be exactly the same. It, there's going to be some different functionality to it, so to yeah. speak. Yeah. For people who aren't familiar at all with the Spellman Files and have decided to watch this anyway because they don't care about spoilers, the premise is it's a family of private investigators. Um, and the fact that they're all private investigators in this family has sort of warped their view of the world and of, of each other eventually. And so nobody has any trust for anybody. Always, they always end up following each other. It's a 
fantastic concept. Like, the family is amazing. There's the, obviously, the mom and dad are the founders of the, uh, the detective agency. The perspective character of all the books so far has been Isabel Spellman. She's the oldest daughter. Uh, she has a younger sister named Ray, who is... A much younger sister. Much younger sister. I, she's... I'm trying to find a way to describe her character. She's a free spirit. Like, they're all kind of, in their way, just wacky. Uh, which is really cool how they sort of make all the characters work and be interesting and yet be their own person. Isabel is very much the rebel. Uh, especially, you can, you can tell that she, she was big trouble when she was a teenager coming up. Um, Ray is not as much that, but she's still very much offbeat and uh, that really brings a lot to her character as well. And then, of course, there's the brother, David, who at the beginning of the book series, he's kind of interesting to me because he progresses. Well, him and Ray both really progress a lot throughout the series um, as to what his personality is. Um, and by the time he finally ends up getting married in the fourth or fifth book, remember how far along it is? I don't remember which one it is in. Um, but he was, he was always, like, super, like, really concerned about his appearance, and he was a lawyer, and he made a lot of money, and it was always about, you know, looking good and... He was the smartest and had the best grades. And right, he was the good child. child. The favorite child, as Isabel would always refer to him. And so, by the, when he got married, he's just like, done. Don't care. Started wearing sweatpants, not worried about his hair. No, it wasn't after he got married. It was after he had a child. Okay. Because she, his wife, couldn't really handle staying at home all the time. So David said, okay, I'll do this. You go to work. I'll stay home and take care of um, the daughter, whose name I can't remember right now. Oh, so yeah. So we will hear and refer to her as Princess Banana. Princess Banana. Because that is the way she is referred to throughout almost all of the, the, last, the word. last word. Yeah. Which, the princess thing, the banana thing is from the previous book, Trail of the Spellmans, where Ray teaches her to say, oh, what did she say? Apples. She doesn't like apples. Anytime, any, like, she associates all food with apples, or just bananas? No. Everything was a banana. She called everything a banana, except when you held out an apple, or banana, held up an actual a banana, banana, she would say, no apple, no apple. But... That was Ray's little bit of psychological engineering. You can tell how well I remember these. She remem she remembers them better than I do, uh, because I'm reading like eight books at a time half the time, so I have uh, my brain doesn't work anyway. But <laughs> regardless, um, the uh, the the little girl who in this book really becomes almost a uh, an antagonist to the main. <laughs> she's so. I don't even know what the word is. She gets she gets very prissy. In this book, she's uh, the grandmother starts teaching the granddaughter. The grandmother's a weird character. Like they try to make nobody her out to... in the family really wants to be around Grammy Spellman. Yeah, she's she's a horrible person, but somehow not quite entirely unlikable. I don't know what it is about her, but like when you when I'm reading her, I don't hate her. She's saying mean things to everybody, but I'm like. And, you know, I can cut her some slack. <laughs> Maybe that's just me. Um, but the grandma goes over and she starts teaching Princess Banana about, you know, what it means to be a lady. I'm like, oh, ladies don't eat this kind of... They don't eat cookies. They eat... What do they eat? Like... Melba toast. Melba toast. I don't even know what that is. It sounds terrible. It's basically almost like dried out bread. but So it's really crispy, but it's like... Bready tasting. So it's like stale tasting. So to the extreme, yeah. Okay. <laughs> anyway, she gives her all these little pointers on how to be a princess. You know, princess does this, princess does that. And so that's sort of a, a driving conflict for the, for the book, uh, The Last Word, is that they're trying to deal with her just basically not like being above everyone else she, she gets she takes the princess thing and really goes a little bit too far with it and it's way too far no izzy no izzy and you figure out it's not that she doesn't like her aunt isabel it's just the grandmother was saying you don't want to eat this like isabel does you don't want to do this like isabel does because it's not princess or ladylike 
So you come to realize that she just says no Izzy because everything about Isabel is not, is completely opposite from the princess and the ladylike stride that she's trying to get into. But you kind of get the sense that the grandma there is almost um, trying to stave off her becoming like Isabel. Like that she's worried that she's going to turn into Isabel. And so she's like, I, I messed it up with the last batch, but this one I'm going to get right. And so she's going through, like, starting when she's three, like, the princess does this, princess doesn't act like Isabel. Um, but the, uh, the main, I don't know if you want to call it, the main conflict uh, of the story is has to do with Isabel's new employer from the last book. Last book, Isabel had a lady hire her to follow this guy, and she didn't trust the motives of the lady. So she starts investigating why the client is having her follow this guy, you know, meets him, becomes friends with him. There's a whole big thing in the previous book about the family doesn't think that she should investigate because it's, you know, kind of a client privilege type of thing. Yeah. Um, so, but but regardless, he's here from that book uh, still. And he kind of, since she actually saved him some money and some heartache from, because of what the, the it was actually turned out to be his wife was scheming, or no, she's just cheating on him, right? She was cheating on him behind his back, and so she had Isabel following him so that she would know where he was, where he was, so she could, you know, get it on with whoever, um, and not be caught. And of course, Isabel exposes her, and you know, the guy is an older gentleman. Uh, the he was running his own company, or at least the CEO of. Um, but he's he, he's you know he kind of takes her under his wing. It's kind of a mutual helping relationship because he's helping her try to become more responsible which is sort of a theme throughout all of the books you start in the first book the spellman files and she's just she's off the chain i mean and that's kind of what's fun about her at least to start with is that she's just crazy you know she doesn't want to live by anybody's rules she's not really a she doesn't strike me as directly countercultural. she's just not interested in being bored almost like she's cl she's always climbing in and out of the windows she's she's trying to preoccupy herself is the way i see it and part of it in you know her later years is it's what she's become accustomed to kind of like you know she would sneak in and out you know as a teenager get into trouble and as she got you know into adulthood she was doing you know investigative work so she was still sneaking in and out of windows and then sometimes that she shouldn't have been sneaking in and out of their next door neighbor. <laughs> right. But then even, you know, when she's in a stable relationship and she's mellowing out, she's finally, you know, calming down a little bit and taking on a new perspective with life. She still can't break the habit and she's still climbing in and out of Henry's window, which is, you know, her ex her most recent ex-boyfriend. That's a big spoiler, by the way. If you haven't read the series, she doesn't end up with Henry. <sighs> yeah, I know. It's in the first ten pages, if I believe. They come out and say, you know, you've got this hope that maybe they're going to get back together. Because they broke up at like, the end of the last book, and you're like, please, please. This is the they're one so solid thing, and, you know, the good thing you know, that she's got going on. And they ruin it by saying, you know, they've been broke up six months, and Henry's most current girlfriend is going to be having a baby. And Isabel, you know, you finally see that breakdown, like she's hiding in the closet and she's crying over this, and she's never cried over any other ex-boyfriend. And she brings up the point to him, you know, kind of jokingly, but kind of like, at the same time, like, I can't believe what's going on, that he's had at least one or two other girlfriends since, you know, the breakup, but this one is pregnant, and then they're getting married. It's like a rush kind of a... A wedding thing but you can honestly see there's something that has changed in her where she's really kind of broke up about this so then you think okay well maybe this is a ploy maybe something is gonna happen and Henry's trying to you know be friends with her and getting her to try to go out and have drinks with him and she's kind of blowing him off well we can't imagine why <laughs> well yeah I understand <laughs> so it kind of shatters that dream that they're gonna get back together Isabel's finally going to settle down and move on with her life. And they throw this whole 
pregnancy issue in. It just totally blew my mind, and I almost didn't want to finish reading the book, but I did, and it was pretty okay. The issue, the thing is, the the thing with her and Henry is kind of foreshadowing the entire problem that I have with the book, because like Ashley said, you think maybe she's going to get to be more responsible, maybe she's going to mellow out, maybe she's going to become the person who you kind of feel she's becoming through the series. That's one of the great things about the series, I feel like, is that you see her changing throughout, you know, as, as things progress, you see, okay, she's, you know, maybe not quite as wild. She keeps her personality, she keeps what makes her fun and interesting as a character, but especially with the end of the last book, uh, the last one before this one, uh, which was, I forget which number it was. <laughs> Wait, look here. Uh, that's... I don't even know what number that is. Revenge. Spellman Files. Curse of the Spellmans. I don't know. They're not numbered. Why are they not numbered? Regardless. First one. Right? Second one. Revenge of the Spell... No. Curse? Yeah. Revenge. Third one. Strike Fourth again. One. Oh, and the fifth the one trail. was the one I don't have. Well, I don't know why I'm looking for it. I just talked for five minutes about how I didn't like it. Um, I mean, the cover. Uh, the, in the fifth one, she takes over the family business. She does a hostile takeover with some money that she gets from the guy who she helped out re recently, buys out her brother and sister's share, and then she has three shares of the business, and her mom and dad have two shares, so she is the controlling interest. And you think, okay, this is finally going to be her chance to shine. This is finally going to be when she takes off and she becomes something more. And instead, the power goes to her head, and she wants to be she, manipulative. And yeah, she just she continues doing exactly what she was doing before. She continues with, I, I, well, yeah, like Ashley said, she, she's just manipulative. She thinks she, she can just order her mom and dad around just because she's the boss. And there's a great scene between her and uh, oh, who's the guy who's the ex-con, but was Demetrius. In, Demetrius, the guy who she or D as they call him. I think in the third or fourth book she helped him uh, get out of prison because he'd been wrongly, wrongfully accused and now he works for them and he comes to her and he says this great conversation with her where he's like listen Isabel just because you're the boss of Spellman Investigations doesn't mean that your mom and dad can't take their contacts and the people who know them and trust them as people and start their own business and go somewhere else <laughs> and she's like oh I've never thought of that. I'm kind of screwed, aren't I? And she, he's like, yeah, you kind of are. But even then, the, which they don't do. Uh, they, I kind of think mostly because they're just tired and old and ready to sort of retire and be on their own. But even then, you kind of feel like the mom is trying to push her to be in charge, like she needs to be in charge. She doesn't give her the help that she could. She doesn't, like, just prop her up and be like, okay, I'm going to do everything for you. She's like, fine, you think you can run things? Here you go. Learn how to do, you know, the payroll software and pay all the bills and keep everybody happy. And ultimately, she screws it up. Like, that's the ultimate thing. In fact, the, the one of the last chapters in the books, she has all her mysteries. Which are not, to me, those aren't the main issue, but she's investigating things for uh, the guy who's her benefactor, uh, Slater, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Slater. Um, there's somebody who's trying to show that he, he, had, he has Alzheimer's, which is really interesting uh part of the book that um he'll be taking her jogging with her and she starts this thing because she does know that he has alzheimer's she'll tell him three words and have him repeat the words back to her and by the end of, like at the beginning of the book he does it pretty okay by the end of the book she hasn't even told him words and he's repeating them back um and definitely has lost some grip but he's still pretty functional even as someone with alzheimer's and he knows that he has alzheimer's and he's sort of organized his life in such a way that he can still function as the head of this company for a while, but someone in the company is trying to discredit him. And so sort of the main conflict of the story is her trying to figure out how that's going on. But that's really ancillary to the family problems and her personal problems. Just one of the things I like about these stories is it's not... The, the plot isn't the plot. You know what I mean? There's there's other stuff. If there's a lot of subtext. It's not just about, will she find out who did it? She will at the end, but there's more to it than that. And I really enjoy that there's that extra stuff in there. But regardless, she gets to the end and she has this chapter where she realizes, I didn't solve any of this. 
and you know I was just I was just a screw up and that's sort of the end of the book she just says you know well it just sort of happened that I was able to figure it all out uh, you know she points out how that all this stuff happened through happenstance and you know people just happened to be in the right place she wasn't really a good investigator and that's it it's the end she's giving up she says she has she says I could stand you know I could stay here and be writing my memoirs until I'm 67 and old and still pottering or you know pottering around doing whatever but I'm just I'm gonna stop now and that and really disappointed me sorry go ahead I was say, and that you know I was expecting something different you know something like she's gonna finally you know do something out of the ordinary but the book closes up with her just admitting defeat this is how it's gonna be the rest of her life I mean she you know her parents now have control of the company again they've got the most stock um, shares because she lets Ray buy out buy her shares back and Ray is gonna be coming back into the business and so she's just like okay yeah you know this is how it's gonna be I'm you know stepping down I'm just gonna have a you know, desk job paperwork go out and investigate but do things like they should have been done all along instead of you know goofing off and doing all this other madness but it's like she makes it sound like it's the end for her like <sighs> you know, she's never going to progress exactly right you get basically it becomes what i call sitcom syndrome or nobody's ever allowed or any any really long running episodic tv show this is my big beef with bones nobody changes nobody ever changes and in this series people do change but for some reason the narrator can't is it all no she's just gonna stay the same it's <sighs> and bones did change by the way in season six season six <laughs> they you know or season seven they have a baby they're living together they love each other blah Spoilers. blah blah yeah Okay, so eventually these people do change. And to some extent, you say, okay, you, you understand how this is a longer, drawn-out thing. You have a series. Uh, you don't want to have it change too fast. But especially with this being the last one from Isabel's perspective, to not resolve any of that, to not see her become something more, to just have her, especially because you see her reaching for it. You see her almost getting there, and then she's just like, yeah, no, I'm never going to be that. I, so and disappointing. And you also got the question, you know, that Henry asked her, you know, granted, he's beyond drunk, but he's like, why couldn't you just be normal? And then she dwells on that. She goes, you know, what, is, what do you think that means? Why couldn't you just be normal? I, I don't think she's, I mean, he loves her because she's not normal. I, I don't think that that's, you know, she's giving it too much thought, and he's probably broken up, probably not really thrilled about the fact that he's going to be getting married. He says he loves the lady, and I think that he's telling the truth. But I also feel like if Isabel had been willing to have kids with him, he would be with her, I mean, forever. But he's he knows, and Henry's at deal too, is he's older. He knows he's getting older. And she's and I'm still older mad too. about that. That's like the, the big, I don't know, I just really wanted something to happen, and it didn't. And I know I've already ranted, so I won't rant again. But, girl, it just really makes me so mad. <laughs> Well, too, she's with this other guy who we know, we meet for, like, five pages now, where, she, where Ray says, oh, yeah, she's just going out babysitting with this, you know, it's an, babysitting is an excuse for them to go on a date. We never see them have any chemistry. I mean, th he's a nice guy. They get along. It's not like, ah, we're at each other's throats. You never get the feeling. But it's not babysitting. It's a play date for Isabel and well, You know what I'm Claire. saying, though. Like, you don't buy, I don't buy that they're interested in each other like that. To the level that they need to be for her to have some kind of a happy ending. Right, but it does show kind of Isabel's, I guess in a way she is growing a little bit because she didn't like kids and she still doesn't even like her niece, Princess Diana. She can't really stand her. But you can see at one point, you know, Claire comes over and Claire hugs her legs and Isabel's like, you know, her heart's melting. She's like, come up here, come sit next to me, you know, let's have some goldfish and some juice or whatever. They watch and Phineas she and plays Ferb. with them. Exactly. You know, <laughs> I've got they're, hooked on Phineas and Ferb now. So, like, this whole issue <laughs> Thank with you, Lisa her Lutz. never wanting kids, and she's never really been close to her niece, but you see this relationship between her and the, the and Claire, the little girl. Yeah. So, 
But it's too little too late. Like, now she's going to be okay with kids and Henry's off with somebody else and she's pregnant and we're still mad. Yes. <sighs> anyway. But th to me, I mean, I d yeah, I see what you're saying with her changing, but I'm not convinced that this relationship isn't going to end like every other single relationship that she's ever had. She's not a good girlfriend. Well, maybe <laughs> that's the difference with this relationship is the fact that she's not looking at it from a relationship standpoint because they're still saying... She hangs out with Max and Claire as playdates, you know. So it's more about them Maybe. doing stuff together and not really being on a sexual. What they're basis. just gonna like be friends for the rest of their lives? They're gonna get married? And not? I mean. I don't know. Maybe with time, you know, something will develop. But. Um, Maybe. Yeah, but the big one of the other big things is you know, for mo almost the whole book, her mom and her dad are totally not doing anything work-wise and they start doing little bits here and there and Isabel's so wrapped up with everything that's going on and just being everywhere that she doesn't even realize that her dad is you know having problems like like dying problems yeah. uh, he doesn't die I was a little bit annoyed by that not because I don't like Albert as a character Albert's her dad's name uh, I really do like Albert but I felt like it would have tied everything together a little bit better, especially because in the first book, it ends with her uncle Ray dying. Ray spelled R-A-Y. They named the daughter R-A-E, Ray, after him, because uh, she's born shortly after. But, or, no, no after. No, 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 yeah, he's she's still alive when she's, I'm an idiot. I, I knew that, too. Because she was, like, early teens when he was going off on these vacations, as they called them. Um, yeah, these benders. Yeah, and they'd have to go out and drag him home from whatever bar or place where he was at, you know, super drunk and gambled away, and they'd have to drag him back home. Yeah. Anyway, so I felt like that letting Albert die would have, first of all, just, like, wrapped up the series kind of thematically, because the first book ends with someone dying very close to them, and the last book, last-ish, I don't know if, you know, there's some, maybe it's going to be some from Ray's perspective, but the, this book could have ended with, with Albert dying. And all the books in the middle have something to do with him having high blood pressure or high cholesterol. Yeah, well, it's like you're and foreshadowing you know, all this stuff and it's like, yeah, he's on this I'm diet, not going to pull the trigger on that. And you've got, you know, Ray, who's constantly hiding junk food and, you know, the mother doesn't want any of that bad stuff in the house. And so she goes and has all these junk food stashes everywhere. You know, like at Henry's house, she has a drawer full of snacks and everybody knows where her, you know about them, but... Still, the point is, like you said, he's not doing so well. He's having, like, a midlife crisis in the first book. And then, you know, his brother dies. Midlife freak out. Yes. <laughs> Anyways. And then you have, you know, like, his deteriorate, you know, off and on health issues. So it would have been interesting to see how Isabel would have reacted along with the family um, should a major crisis like that happen. The dad dies. But it did not. And that was kind of like a, you're kind of sitting there, well, is he going to die? You know, who's going to be the match for the bone marrow donor? And I liked that it was Isabel in the end, that she was the match. Um, and Ray was all like, I'm going to eat healthy, I'm going to be perfect, I'm going to have you know, be the match. And then they're like, nope, you're not a match. But you know, that is one of the things that I did enjoy at the very end, is he tells her several times, you know, you're my favorite. But she's like, yeah, well, you tell that to everybody, you know, they're your favorite at the moment. And then you see um, several times he says, you're most like me, you know, you're my daughter. And so you've got that kind of emotional acceptance going on. Whereas in the other books, she always seemed like, you know, she was a screw up. You know, we're not bailing you out of jail this time. You've got to figure out, you know, what you're going to do. They're going to fire you. You know, and she takes over the company. They hate her, you know, it seems like they hate her for that. I don't think yeah. they hate her. I just think well, that they're know, trying to pay back. They're, they're it's a little bit of a it. chance to dig back at her for all the stuff but, that but she But throughout did the whole series, you know, she talks about David being the favorite and, you know, Ray this. And you never see her make any connection with her parents, really. And so to see this at the very end, you know, with her dad saying, you're most like me, you know, you're my daughter. It was a big change. And I kind of like that. But. Yeah, that was definitely really, good. You know. It wasn't, it wasn't a total wash of a book. We didn't hate it completely. 
But it just felt like, again, as a whole series, it felt like it was building to something, and this book was the thing it was building to, and when they got to this book, when Lisa Lutz, I don't know if it was Lisa Lutz or her agent or, you know, whoever said, well, you can't do all this stuff you want to do, or maybe she just decided she didn't want to do it, couldn't tell you, but it feels like that it was going towards something, and then whoever got scared that it wasn't going to play well with the audience, if they went too far, if they changed Isabel, if they let Albert die, whatever, and they're like, whoa. We're not gonna. We're not gonna go there. Uh, and so you end again. Like I already said this, but with Isabel talking about, you know, I can just be old and you know keep writing these stories. And I'm not gonna do that. And basically just admitting, hey, I'm I'm done. This is my life. I'm a screw up. I mean, I, I you know she has the acceptance of her parents and everything, but it doesn't feel like a conclusion to me. Uh, there's stuff that concludes, but for the family, it, it doesn't feel like anything is wrapped up for Isabel at all. She's just still out there doing her own thing. And not in like a, we're going to all go off and have new adventures kind of a way, just sort of like... <laughs> right. And I know one of the big things in this book that was missing compared to the other ones is you didn't have as many recordings of conversations. Yeah. Like, you know, they always wanted proof of something, and so they go around and they always had a tape recorder in their pockets. Any of these, like, this is a little bit of a thing that annoyed me on the new book as well. If you look at basically any of the, I, I can't really show you, but the chapter lengths in the first book were fairly short comparatively. And you had like a lot of these. some that was only like a page long. Yeah, and you would have uh, transcripts of interviews, and it kind of jumped around with the types of, you know, it was, it was almost playing with the, the text, but by the time you get to uh, the last word, the chapters are much longer, it doesn't have the same feel, um, and you lose a lot of that kind of funness around, the, like, like she said, with the interviews and the, the transcripts and, and recreations of scenes and stuff. Um, that were times of events. You know, yeah, jumping like around. Diary and stuff. The the first book really was almost t Tarantino esque, with how it would jump around. If you start, we start here, like near the end of the story. The the last word tries to do that it has like the first chapter or the first epilogue or whatever is jumping forward to when she's in trouble, and then the rest of the book just just powers through like normal. And I understand that you can't always jump around in time. But it may, maybe not to the extent that the first book did, because she covers a lot of ground in the first book, and you're kind of compressing down to a shorter time span. But it still felt like that there was something missing there, that it wasn't the same spirit um, as, as the previous books had been. But if you gear up and think, okay, maybe there's going to be a next book, and it's going to be more from Ray's perspective, maybe they're you know, trying to get you more aware of that. Because, maybe. like... In this last book, it's more about, you know, Ray's new vision of how the company should be run, how they should take on, you know, just mediocre cases. Um, but, like, she follows... Well, she has a new vision around. about, not, not just about how the company should be run, but, well, like, what type of business they should do. She has her, what does she call it? Uh, problem solving. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. You're about to talk about it anyway. I interrupted you. You said something better, where she goes and like lets people air out of people's tires. A conflict resolution specialist. Yes. Um, and that was really interesting too. That she's saying like, let's not just follow people around and find out things for them. Let's give our clients results, some type yeah. of satisfaction. So and that was a really interesting idea, and I want to see that happen. Like I'm, I do want to go forward into the whatever book she's going to read. I'm going to read that book. Don't get me wrong. I'm not. I haven't soured enough on on sort of where the series went that um, I don't want to know what happens next, especially if Ray gets to do what she's talking about doing. But uh, it just it felt like there was some punches pulled. This could have been better. It was not terrible, and I, overall I recommend the series, but just a little bit unsatisfying. Any final words? Go out, start with the first one. Yeah, start you with the first one. If you have, then we've spoiled like all the major points of the books, although we skipped over a lot of yeah, minutia in the middle books. Yeah, we've left a lot of stuff out, like <laughs> um, the justice for Meriwether and you know Free Schmidt. We should have worn some shirts. If you want to know more about it, pick up documents one, two, and three. 
And if you keep, yeah, pick them up, check them out for yourselves if you ha if you haven't already. They're definitely well worth it. Um, I'm looking forward to maybe the story, the series continues. Maybe some of these issues get resolved in future books. But for me, this just didn't quite hit the mark. Thanks for watching, you guys. I don't know if we're going to do any more of these. Uh, I may have some other guests in, or uh, we'll talk about some other things. Who knows? If you like them, let us know. If not, don't let us know because our egos are fragile. <laughs> um, Maybe next time we'll just have the cuteness here. We have the baby. He's asleep in the other room. I was, I was convinced he was going to wake up and start screaming and ruin this, but we got through it. So, uh, good job. Thank you to my co-host here. I'm Albert Berg. This is Ashley Berg, and uh, we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.